Apapun yang kau perbuat, perbuatlah dengan segenap hatimu Seperti untuk Tuhan dan bukan untuk manusia Kerjakan dengan setia apapun yang ia percayakan Mahkota kehidupan ia janjikan Ia janjikan, ia janjikan bagimu Not all Eastern Orthodox call down God's curse on Protestants in their worship services, but all do embrace the Second Council of Nicaea. If anyone rejects any written or unwritten tradition of the Church, let him be anathema. Anathema to those who do not venerate the holy and venerable icons. Anathema to those who say that the making of icons is a diabolical invention and not the tradition of our Holy Fathers. Despite anathematizing Protestant-sounding ideas in the 8th century, Eastern Orthodox insist the Protestant claim that the Scriptures alone are infallible is a 16th century heresy. For being severed or rent away from the Westerns, and consequently being absolutely rejected by the whole Catholic Church and convicted, they are manifestly heretics and the chiefest of heretics. Eastern Orthodox insists theirs is the historic church with demonstrable apostolic succession. They say their patriarchs have a charisma of office to maintain the faith and sustain the infallibility of their church. That narrative is challenged by the story of Kyrillus Lucarus, or as he is known in the West, Cyril Lucarus. He was the 17th century ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople and was credited with publishing a confession of faith that sounds very Protestant. We believe the authority of the Holy Scripture to be above the authority of the Church. To be taught by the Holy Spirit is a far different thing from being taught by a man. For man may through ignorance err, deceive and be deceived. But the Word of God neither deceives nor is deceived, nor can err, and is infallible and he has eternal authority. We believe that the most merciful God he has predestined his elect unto glory before the beginning of the world without any respect of their works and that there was no other cause to this election but only the goodwill and mercy of God. We believe that man is justified by faith and not by works. But when we say by faith, we understand the correlative or object of faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, which, as if by hand, faith apprehends and applies unto us for our salvation. This we say without any prejudice to good works, for truth itself teaches us that works must not be neglected, that they are necessary means to testify to our faith and confirm our calling. But that works are sufficient for our salvation, that they can enable one to appear before the tribunal of Christ, and that of their own merit they can confer salvation, human frailty witnesses to be false. But the righteousness of Christ, being applied to the penitent, alone justifies and saves the faithful. We permit those that so desire to have icons of Christ and of the saints, but the worship and service of them, as being forbidden by the Holy Spirit in sacred scripture, we reject, lest we should forget and instead of the Creator and Maker adore colors and art and creatures.
Lucarius was patriarch, often known for another nine years after the publication of the Confession. He was eventually martyred by the Sultan in 1638, and his body dumped in the Bosphorus. Three months later, his successor called a council in Constantinople to anathematize both him and his confession. To Cyril, surnamed Lucaris, who in the title of his lawless chapters slanderously alleges that the whole Eastern Church of Christ thinks as the Calvinists do. Anathema! To Cyril, the new iconoclast and worst of all. Anathema! Lucarus and his confession were condemned again at another council of Constantinople in 1642 and the Synod of Yashi in the same year. They said those who supported the confession were to be treated as heathen and publicans. And let them be subject to an internal anathema and excommunicated by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the only God, one in nature, both in the present life and in that which is to come, and cursed, and unforgiven, and unabsolved after death, and partakers of internal punishment. For decades, the consensus seemed to be that Lucarus was the author of the confession that bore his name. But that tended to undermine Eastern Orthodox claims for apostolic succession. In 1672, Patriarch Decithius of Jerusalem called a new council. It declared, The Eastern Church never regarded Cyril as being as the Calvinists claimed, or ever admitted the confession to be his. Decithius hadn't even been born when Lucarus died, but he and the council declared that it had always been understood that Lucarus had denied authorship, and the earlier councils had anathematized him only because he had neglected to do so in writing. They provided excerpts from his sermon. It was a fantastic opponent of its heresies. This is a position still articulated by many today. There's an argument to be made that his confession was a forgery or that it was altered mm. um, and, uh, you know, by Calvinist intrigue. In the year 2009, the Patriarch of Alexandria declared Lucarus a saint, and in 2022, the Ecumenical Patriarch did the same. So the question confronts us. Was Lucarus a self-described Calvinist, or was he an Orthodox martyr who rejected Calvin as a heretic? And what are the implications for Eastern Orthodoxy? Before we look to the evidence, it's important to recognize that embarrassing histories have often been rewritten in the Church. The 4th century bishop Eusebius of Caesarea said that Constantine was baptized at Nicomedia, a city in modern Turkey, just before he died in the year 337. Eusebius personally knew Constantine and wrote his account less than two years after Constantine's death. His story was confirmed by Ambrose, the 4th century bishop of Milan, who records that it was only in his final hours Constantine was freed from all his sins by the grace of baptism. The 5th century church historian Sozomen likewise said, His illness, however, increased, and he went to Nicomedia and was initiated into holy baptism. The same story is told in numerous other sources. The problem in all this is that the bishop of Nicomedia was another Eusebius, who was the leader of the Arian heresy. He had called the synod that had overturned Arius' excommunication. And it was this that precipitated the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. At that council, he signed the creed, but he refused to sign the anathemas, insisting Arius had been misunderstood. He was exiled by Constantine for three months, but he worked with Arius to reword their teachings and convince Constantine to return them to office, while exiling their opponents, including Athanasius. The Orthodox Saint Jerome in his Chronicon records for the year 337, Constantine, baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia at the very end of his life, falls into the dogma of Arius. So complete was Eusebius' victory that months after Constantine's death he was made Bishop of Constantinople. There he called a council 
that approved a replacement for the Nicene Creed without the term homoousia. A generation later, Arianism was ultimately rejected by the Emperor Theodosius, and there was an attempt to rehabilitate Constantine's memory. He would eventually be declared a saint and equal to the apostles. To explain away his connections with Arianism, a work known as the Acts of Sylvester appeared in the 5th century, claiming to have been written by the same Eusebius of Caesarea, who had said Constantine's baptism was in the year 337 in Nicomedia. This account moved it back over a dozen years and nearly a thousand miles to the west. Instead of being baptized by Bishop Eusebius, it had him baptized by Pope Sylvester in Rome. Constantine is portrayed as suffering from leprosy. He's told by the pagan priest he must bathe in the blood of infants. This is a dozen years after his dream and subsequent victory at Milvian Bridge. But we're to believe he was agreeable. Until moved by the cries of the mothers, he decided not to proceed. That night, Constantine is visited in a dream by the apostles Peter and Paul, who say they've been sent from Jesus in reward for his not killing the children. They send him to Sylvester, who shows him icons of the saints that he affirms were the ones from his dream. Constantine is baptized and his leprosy healed. Like so many such stories, it isn't content with a single miracle. It includes a contest between Sylvester and twelve rabbis. One whispers the divine name in the ear of a bull, and it immediately dies. Sylvester then whispers Jesus' name in the dead bull's ear, and it comes to life again. Sylvester is also described as stopping the mouth of a dragon. Despite contradicting established history, the acts were popular in Rome, in part because they arose after the city had been sacked by the vandals. Rome had not only been replaced by Constantinople as the capital of the empire, but even the western part of that empire. In the year 408, the seat of government had been moved from Rome to Ravenna on the Adriatic. At a time when the western empire was on the brink of collapse, the Acts of Sylvester declared Rome the center of the church. Its stories would later be expanded to include the claim that Constantine gave Sylvester and succeeding popes political power over the whole of the west. The Acts also found an audience in the East, because they helped distance Constantine from heresy and baptize the union of church and state. The significance of all this is not just that Eastern Orthodox rewrite history. They claim the same infallibility for their hymns as they do for their creeds, and they've hymned the story of Sylvester baptizing Constantine as real history. The Romanian Akathist to Saints Constantine and Elena reads, Rejoice! For with the knowledge and will of God you fell ill with the disease of leprosy. Rejoice that the greatest saints of the apostles have appeared to you. Rejoice that through the teaching of the holy Pope Sylvester you believed in our Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. The Serbian version reads, Rejoice because through the teachings of the holy Pope Sylvester you believed in our Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. And the Greek version reads, Rejoice, you who were baptized by Sylvester in Rome. What Eastern Orthodoxy hymns contradicts not only numerous histories, but also numerous saints. It's based on a demonstrable fraud, the Acts of Sylvester. But now that it's been hymned, this trumps all the evidence, because the Church declares itself infallible. Please keep all this in mind now, as we turn back to the history of Cyril Lucaris. The Center for Traditionalist Orthodox Studies dismisses Cyril's confession as a forgery because it originally appeared in Latin, a language with which it said Lucaris wasn't proficient. The idea is often promoted that Calvinist ambassadors to Constantinople forged a confession in Cyril's name and circulated it in Protestant countries without Cyril's knowledge. But we have the Greek manuscript on which the Latin was based, and a Greek version of the Confession was produced four years after the Latin one. It circulated throughout Constantinople during Cyril's lifetime. The fact that it was published in Geneva is often said to lend weight to it being the fruit of Calvinist intrigue. But Geneva was also where Lucaris printed his translation of the New Testament into modern Greek 
This was because the Jesuits had convinced the Turks to destroy his own printing press in Constantinople. The Jerusalem Council insisted that no work undisputably his or in his own hand is found giving expression to such notions as the heretics of Ur. But along with the original Greek manuscript of the Confession, we have a copy with this attestation. This copy agrees with the original written in my own hand. Let no one have any doubts. Cyril, Patriarch of Constantinople. Over a century ago, Metropolitan Philaretus Bautetus compared a facsimile of the original manuscript and the attestation to known letters of Lucarus. He admitted in his ecclesiastical history that the handwriting was the same. We also have dozens of letters testifying to Lucarus' beliefs, such as this one to his friend Antoine Leger. If I die, I wish you to be able to testify that I die an Orthodox Catholic in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the teaching of the Gospel as contained in the Belgic Confession, in my own confession, and in all the confessions of the Evangelical Churches, which are all alike. I hold in abomination the errors of the Papists and the superstitions of the Greeks. I approve and embrace the doctrine of the most excellent teacher John Calvin and of all who agree with him. Two years later, we have this letter to Leger from Lucarus's personal chaplain, Nathaniel Canopius. I will translate the Belzic Confession into Greek as well as the one written by the late scholarly and wise master Kelvin, and I shall send them to you for printing in order that our people shall also be able to learn God's truth and how they should believe, because you know how darkened their minds have become. So on the one hand, we have the Jerusalem Council telling us there is oral tradition that Cyril affirmed with an oath that he was not the author of the chapters. While on the other hand, we have autographed copies and numerous letters telling us otherwise. Just as with the attestation on the manuscript of the Confession, the signatures on the letters match signatures on undisputed letters from Lucarus. The suggestion has been raised that he was telling the Protestants one thing while telling the Orthodox another. The confession was published under his name. Okay. However, uh, it, there, there is historical record that he orally disowned it on more than one occasion. The shock is that apparently he never disowned the confession in writing. However, if it does come from his pen, as some think, then we have, we're left with the, uh, the problem of his other theological writings, which are not Calvinistic and which directly contradict the confession of faith that supposedly he wrote. Interesting. It should be noted that sermons preached by Josiah Trenum as an Orthodox priest in 1993 would be very different from the ones he preached just a year earlier as a student at a Presbyterian seminary. The funny thing about the sermon cited by the Council of Jerusalem was that none of them specified the year in which it was preached, and the book from which they were copied no longer seems to exist. Lucarus had been patriarch for 20 years in Alexandria and 9 years in Constantinople, all prior to the Confession's publication. He had served temporarily as ecumenical patriarch 17 years prior, and had preached in Constantinople even earlier. We're being told to believe any contradictory sermon from any date means he couldn't have written the confession. Besides not specifying years, many of the sermons cited by the council don't actually contradict the confession. This excerpt is offered against his second chapter. As none can sail across the sea without a boat, so thou canst not steer through this world and its billows and escape them without a boat, which is the Church of Christ. Many endeavor to sail across it, such are the impious and all the heretics, who are not within the church of God, but they are all drowned. When God made the ark, all that were within escaped, while those that were without perished. The church of God is this ark. Since Lucarus acknowledged that the church has authority, the council believed this proved the confession of fabrication. But this is a straw man. Remember, the confession doesn't deny the authority of the church. Rather, it says we believe the authority of the Holy Scripture to be above the authority of the Church. In the same way, the Council appealed to Lucarus saying faith without works is dead. But remember, the Confession says works must not be neglected. Some real contradictions were presented, 
We just have no idea in which year they were actually written. Lucarius clearly didn't begin his ministry as a Calvinist. In 1612, he wrote to the Dutch Protestant minister Johannes Ottenbogart. He said his church always remains the same, always keeps and preserves untainted orthodoxy. But as Lucarius read Reformed books, he began to realize that many of the traditions he'd been taught didn't really go back to the apostles. Six years later, he wrote to a former Catholic archbishop who now professed Protestantism. There was a time when we were bewitched, before we understood what was the very pure word of God. And although we did not communicate with the Roman pontiff, we abominated the doctrine of the Reformed churches as opposed to the faith, in good truth, not knowing what we abominated. But when it pleased the merciful God to enlighten us and to give us understanding of our former error, we began to reflect what it was our duty to do. Leaving the fathers, I took for my guide scripture and the analogy of faith alone. At length, through the grace of God, because I discovered that the cause of the reformers was the more just and more in accordance with the doctrine of Christ, I embraced it. I can no longer endure to hear men say that the comments of human tradition are of equal weight with Holy Scripture. The Jerusalem Council complained to the Protestants. They affirmed confidently that he adhered to their heresy, though they never knew him. But those who during many years of contact ministered to him and knew all that concerned him proved that he was no such person. As we've seen, we have decades of letters between Lucarus and his Protestant friends showing they did know him. And as for the Orthodox, after Lucarus's execution, we have Canopius and others fleeing for Protestant countries. We also have the testimony of the 1638 Council of Constantinople. In spite of all the later insistence that it only anathematized Cyril because he didn't deny the confession in writing, this is oral tradition that once again contradicts the written record. Lucarus's successor is Patriarch, Cyril Cantarus of Berea, specifically anathematized the chapters written by him, as Cyril himself the writer. He knew Lucarus and identified him as the author of the confession. In 1638, Cantarus wrote to the Austrian ambassador, calling Lucarus the forerunner of the Antichrist, the Calvinist Cyril. Patriarch Theophanes of Jerusalem is often quoted as saying, Cyril, the most wise patriarch, is so far removed from heresy that it gives us courage to say he was a true high priest, according to Paul, saintly, harmless, charitable, a devout teacher, and an expounder of the correct word, according to piety. Orthodox tend to ignore that eight years later, he was the third person to sign the anathemas against Cyril. The Vatican archives include a deposition given by Athanasius Paterios, three times Patriarch of Constantinople, twice as Lucarus' replacement. He swore under oath in 1635, Cyril was publicly reputed to be a Calvinist, and as such he was deposed from the Patriarchate. This is from a man who has been declared a saint by the Russian Church, and whose relics are said to be incorruptible. All of this has led some Orthodox to admit Lucarus not only wrote the confession, but publicly advocated for it. Lucarus saw himself as a reformer. He wanted to bring the Orthodox Church more in line with the livelier Protestant churches of Europe. The hard logical intellectualism of Calvinism attracted the realistic and cerebral side of Cyril's Greek character. But Cyril misunderstood his own church. To Cyril and his followers, the apophatic approach led merely to ignorance and stagnation. That's what they thought it was. He could not appreciate the sustaining force of tradition. The problem for Archpriest Papa Giorgio is that not only does this call into question the charisma of office, but the Council of Jerusalem explicitly said Lucarus didn't write the confession and was known by the Orthodox as no Calvinist. In the year 2016, the Pan-Orthodox Council said the 1672 Jerusalem Council was led by the Holy Spirit and is of universal authority, just like the ecumenical councils. 
To admit Lucaris wrote the confession and publicly promoted it is to admit the Eastern Orthodox Church is fallible, not just in its hymns, but even in its councils. This is all exacerbated by Lucaris having been declared a saint by the patriarchs of Alexandria and Constantinople. The 1672 Council of Jerusalem denied he was a Calvinist, but they specifically said, Him we regard not as a saint, but as a wretch, and as having no part with Christ. So people are now venerating the icon of the man who denounced the veneration of icons, and who was declared no saint by a council of supposedly universal authority. Instead of a Calvinist conspiracy, what we really have is an orthodox one. The Jerusalem Council insisted that if Lucaris was actually trying to promote Protestant ideas, if so to speak, he had put them forth publicly, three things must necessarily have followed. Firstly, that they should have been signed by the God-fearing bishops that were then with him. Secondly, that they must have been copied into the codices of the great church. And thirdly, that they would have been written in the codex by one of the clerics and not by anyone else. What all this ignores is that some of these God-fearing bishops were conspiring with the Catholics to murder him. Philippe de Harlay was the French ambassador to the Turks in Constantinople. He had no doubts as to what Cyril was teaching. In 1627, two years before the publication of the Confession, he wrote to the Pope's nephew, Cardinal Bandini in Rome, that Lucaris was sending students to Holland to be imbued with the doctrine of Calvin and to spread Calvinism among the Greeks. In another letter the same year, he described Lucaris to the French Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was no sooner established than he began to spread the miserable doctrines of Calvin. This was written two years prior to the publication of the Confession, and described Lucaris as already having been a Calvinist for at least seven years. In the archives of the Vatican's Congregatio de Propaganda Fide, we have references to Lucaris' Calvinism going back to 1623. In 1631, Pope Urban VIII tried Lucaris in absentia, and with the testimony of two of Lucaris's staff and the Austrian ambassador, declared him a heretical Calvinist. The Catholics conspired with Lucaris's enemies in the Orthodox Church, and de Harley documents the massive bribes they paid to the Turks trying to depose him. Four times the Catholics and their Orthodox co-conspirators succeeded in deposing Lucaris, only to see him restored through the support of the people, his bishops, and the Protestant ambassadors. The last three times, he was replaced with Cyril Cantarus. Like the other Cyril, he was a native of the island of Crete, but he was also a graduate of the Jesuit College in Constantinople and strong supporter of Rome. The Austrian ambassador reported on one of the depositions in 1635. At that time, Lucaris was confined for six days in a secret place, completely in the power of the new Patriarch. One day, in my presence, a metropolitan suggested that Lucaris' drink should be poisoned, or else, so that he never again gets to the Patriarch. His eyes should be put out. Both Cantarus and the ambassador feared the people's reaction. Instead, they devised a plan to have him captured on his way to exile by Maltese pirates, or Christian corsairs as they called them. Lucaris would then be taken to Rome to receive a heretic's reward. They could claim innocence. The ambassador made the arrangements, but Cantarus lacked the necessary funds. Soon after, a metropolitan came to me in the Patriarch's name and told me that he wanted to put Cyril Lucaris on a cheaper ship. He asked me for the promised letters and patents, so that no harm would befall the Metropolitan, the shipmen, and Turks through the ships of the Christian Corsairs. Cantarus's delays allowed the plot to be discovered, and instead of Lucaris being sent to die in Rome, Cantarus was exiled by the Turks, and Lucaris was made patriarch for a fifth time. Cantarus escaped exile, and on March 25, 1637, he petitioned Rome for financial help in deposing Lucaris to free her Eastern Church from Calvinism. We not only have Cantarus saying this, but his petition was supported by another 
signed by 19 other Greek clergy. The signers included Theophanes of Phanarius, Benjamin of Paranassia, and others who would later anathematize Lucaris at the 1638 Council of Constantinople. Remember, a generation later, the Council of Jerusalem insisted the Eastern Church never regarded Cyril as being such an one as our adversaries allege, or ever admitted the chapters to be his composition. The Catholics sent the requested funds, and one of Gantaris' chaplains delivered a bribe along with accusations that Lucaris was conspiring with the Cossacks against the Turks. Gantaris was returned to Constantinople and installed a third time as Patriarch, while Lucaris was put on a ship, supposedly for exile. Instead, when the ship was at sea, they strangled him and threw his body into the Bosphorus. Three months later, Cantarus called a council to anathematize Lucaris in his confession. The Austrian ambassador records that Cantarus signed a Catholic statement of faith to secure Rome's continued backing. Few Orthodox today seem to recognize how much influence Rome had at that time among its clergy. Nearly two decades later, Ecumenical Patriarch Parthenius III would denounce the confession of Peter Magilla as too Catholic. But in 1640 he wrote to Pope Urban VIII, To your blessedness I render all due obedience and submission, acknowledging you to be the true successor of the leader of the Apostles and the chief shepherd of the Catholic Church throughout the whole world. With all piety and obedience, I bow before your holy feet and kiss them, asking your blessing. For with full power you guide and tend the whole of Christ's chosen flock. This history of Orthodox conspiring with Catholics and Turks against Lucaris has all been conveniently forgotten, along with Patriarch Cantarus denouncing him as a Calvinist and playing a role in his murder. That conspiracy has given way to a more modern one one meant to make the man martyred by the Orthodox into a martyr for them. Like the Arian Constantine, the Calvinist Cyril Lucaris has been reinvented and declared an Orthodox saint. Metropolitan Callistus Ware said Lucaris was possibly the most brilliant man to have held office as patriarch since the days of St. Photius. To admit that someone so intelligent and so intimately aware of the Orthodox faith declared himself a Calvinist, to admit he was a martyr for that faith, means Eastern Orthodox need to respond to their critics with more than fake histories and caricatures. We document the issues more fully in another video on this channel. But the simple reality is that what they call Orthodoxy isn't the faith of the early church, and what they call Calvinism. It's simply tradition understood in the light of the scriptures, rather than by oral traditions that keep changing. In spite of all the East claims, ours is the historic faith of the Church. Like Athanasius and Jerome, Protestants don't receive the apocryphal books among the canonical scriptures. We have the same view of icons as the Synod of Elvira that took place two decades before Nicaea. There shall be no pictures in the Church lest what is worshipped and adored should be depicted on the walls. Like Tertullian around the year 205, we firmly agree Mary was a virgin before Jesus' birth, but not after. Like the second century epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus, we see Christ's sacrifice as a penal substitutionary atonement. He wrote, Oh, the sweet exchange! Oh, the inscrutable work! Oh, the unexpected benefits that the lawlessness of many might be hidden in one righteous man, while the righteousness of one might justify many lawless men. And like Irenaeus, we recognize that many, when they are confuted from the scriptures, they turn round and accuse these same scriptures as if they were not correct, nor of authority, and that they are ambiguous, and that the truth cannot be extracted from them by those who are ignorant of tradition. For they allege that the truth was not delivered by means of written documents, but orally. At the end of his confession, Lucaris asked the question, Ought the sacred scriptures to be read in the common language by all Christians? His answer was a resounding yes. The Council of Jerusalem, which is said to carry universal authority, 
answered the same question very differently. Ought the sacred scriptures to be read in the common language by all Christians? No, they should not be read by all, but only by those who with fitting research have inquired into the deep things of the Spirit and who know in what manner the divine scriptures ought to be searched and taught and finally read. But to those who are not disciplined or who cannot distinguish or who understand only literally or in any other way contrary to the orthodoxy what is contained in the scriptures, the Catholic Church, knowing by experience the damage that can cause, forbids them to read. Lucarus had the Bible translated into more modern Greek. His successor burned all the copies he could find. Because Eastern Orthodoxy insists the average person doesn't need to study the scriptures for themselves. They have the church to tell them what's true. Constantine was baptized by Sylvester, no matter what Ambrose, Jerome, or anyone else ever said. The church has hemmed it, and the church insists it's infallible. Lucarus was declared no Calvinist by a council of universal authority. This supposedly trumps the confession bearing his attestation and signature, all his letters, and all the letters of his Catholic and Orthodox enemies, because oral tradition and the consciousness of the Church have spoken. The simple reality is that the Church isn't infallible. In the same way it would later lie about him, Lucarus found it was lying about the historic faith. Oral tradition, Church fathers, and even supposedly ecumenical councils have all contradicted one another. But he discovered there is a standard that does not contradict, a standard that is undeniably apostolic, and a standard that presents a Jesus far more glorious and far more loving than he had ever imagined before. A Jesus for whom he was not afraid to fight Rome, the Turks, and even his own countrymen. A Jesus for whom he willingly became a martyr. We believe the authority of the Holy Scripture to be above the authority of the Church. To be taught by the Holy Spirit is a far different thing from being taught by a man. For man may through ignorance err, deceive and be deceived. But the Word of God neither deceives nor is deceived, nor can err, and is infallible and has eternal authority.